Hey everybody and welcome to the next video on the Horsey Chess YouTube channel. I am once again joined by Grandmaster Danny Gormali. As some of you may know if you've been following for a while, Danny has been coaching me. Uh, so we thought we'd show you an example today of an insight into one of the coaching sessions that Danny actually does so you can see how it works. So I'm a bit nervous about this because <laughs> might test me quite a bit but it should be great fun and hopefully you will all find this really instructive and if any of you are interested in um paying danny for coaching yourself he does have a few slots available at the moment so do comment below or get in touch and we can sort that out so danny over to you what will we be doing in today's lesson well zoe i've done a huge amount of preparation as you can imagine and um the first game I'm going to show you as a game played earlier today because I always feel personally speaking, it's either easier to, to show um, games that I've already played and I've played recently or that are fresh in my mind. You know, while I've been looking at the game, I always feel like fresh material is the best material. And generally the way I test people is just to um, get a feel for what their weaknesses are, what needs to be worked on, um and you know i've already we've already discussed that with you yeah i think one of the things you could improve from my previous sessions with you is your ability to evaluate positions sometimes your judgment is a little bit off but we'll see today we'll see um so this is a game play probably still going on actually between Niels grandelius and uh, magnus carlson the norwegian world champion Okay, so Magnus Carlsen doesn't play his normal repertoire. He plays a Sicilian time Marnoff. Why do why do we think he went for the time Marnoff? Why do you think he went for the time Marnoff Sicilian? Um, to surprise Grandelius. Yes, um, but is there another reason why he wouldn't play his normal repertoire, which is like e four e five? Which is oh, because there's well-known draws in that. And he probably wants to try and play for the win. Exactly. So because he's playing Niels, um, who's on a half out of four, as I'm sure you're aware, <laughs> he's on half out of four. Because you're, you're well up to date. <laughs> um, he, he obviously is a situation where he wants to win. And I think that's often important as well in chess, that you need to kind of change slightly you need to be thinking about your opponent and you know is this a game that i feel confident in should i be going for the win here well the game was quite interesting actually um why it played in this position what do you think why it played let's try and guess what i mean what... i would play f3 but then do yeah. we really want to trust what i do sorry do we really want to trust what i do and i have no idea how to play against the sicilian but yeah, I mean, I I would probably play F3 because that's the way I like playing Sicilian. Yeah, I mean, F3 is a, a, a line. I mean, what they always used to play, actually, in the time on, or they always used to play like Bishop E2 or Bishop D3. But theory changes a lot with fashion. Um, yeah, lines of F3 are very popular now, or Queen D2. Even Queen F3 is quite a popular line, actually. I've seen yeah, I just like the idea of castling side. Yeah, and I played that myself, actually, this Queen F3 move. F4 is another move. There's lots and lots of moves. This is one of the reasons why um, people get put off by playing the main line Sicilian as white, because they're afraid of the amount of theory that they need to know. And I've said this to you, that I feel that you become a stronger player if you're willing to go into that kind of uh, lines. You know, you, you're willing to go into those sharp lines. If you're always playing anti-Sicilians, not necessarily learning a lot, you know, yeah. does that make sense? But anyway, in this position, uh, why actually play your move, Zoe? You play G4. Yay, your excellent G4. <laughs> yeah, and again, it's just a question of avoiding any kind of huge amount of preparation. This is a line, and obviously um, how would you, why would you characterise G4 as a move? You know, what would you say about G4? Why did White play G4? I mean, I guess in a lot of Sicilian lines, because Blacks moved the C-pawn, they don't normally want to be castling queenside. 
Um, so often the king, they'll end up castling king side anyway. So you can get the opposite side castling positions. And I guess white's just kind of saying, well, if you're going to castle king side, I'm ready to attack. Is um, there another reason? Because how would black develop? I guess it discourages knight f6. Exactly. So in a way, it's, even though it's an attacking move, it's also a prophylactic move. Yeah, because... so we go knight f6, we go g5. Yeah, we, we, I talked about, uh, before with you about prophylaxis, the important pro of understanding prophylaxis, um, that sometimes you're fight, making life difficult for your opponent. Now, yeah, and I suppose in the lines where we do play f3, we do it because black's already gone knight f6, so we can't go g4. So we're going g4 because we don't need to play f3. Now, if black plays, just to test your understanding of the time on of Sicilian... Which is nothing but yeah yeah but if black pays 97 why might that why might that be a mistake for example because i'm in the timeline of do you not want to go g6 and bishop g7 you want the bishop somewhere else yeah but the first thing you talk about when we're talking about why is that a mistake is it is there a tactic I feel this is one of the reasons, that, this is one of the things that separates um, amateur players from professionals in the sense that professional is far more concrete in their analysis and amateur players have a tendency to generalise. Okay, this might be really stupid, but is there some kind of knight b5? Yeah, and then if you is... take off, you can't go queen d8 because of knight d6. And you'd have to go queen a5... Um, check. Yeah. And yeah. then, I mean, white gets a draw if they want it, right? But probably better. Well, you can go bishop. I was wondering. Yeah, why bishop why d2, and then I if was bishop. I why this isn't winning, but apparently. Queen b6 and bishop b3 again, or whatever. Maybe you can go queen a4 here, Zoe. So if we grab the rook, you take on e4 and take on g1. Yeah, so if you go knight sorry. d6, king d8. So say queen a4, knight d6, king d8, knight f7, king c7, knight takes h, h queen You go e4, queen e4 back. and then take on h1. Exactly. So the reason why I'm thinking it's equal is I'm thinking that after queen a4, it thinks bishop e3 is a good move. And if queen e4, then knight d6. And if knight g6, blocking knight d6, then knight c7 check is dangerous for black. So maybe it thinks there's some weird draw with uh, queen. Okay. And then the queen, queen goes four, back. Three, queen goes back to a5. Yeah. But yeah. As black, you don't really want to even allow these kind of possibilities, you know, like, so knight e7 might be a move, but I think the, the way that black should play here is to play something like b5. Okay. Apparently would have been a better... Because these sacrifices aren't very dangerous if Black's bishop is still covering d6. Um, so b5 would have been... He actually went for something more forcing. He took... Um, he played all this, and... Uh, he got some kind of weird position. f6. Nils was playing the open very well. Yeah, I like, I like quite a lot. I don't like g5 yet, though. I mean, but I think the white needs to attack. I think the the problem is, from a concrete point of perspective, black is maybe threatening to play e5. So if you don't act now, then maybe this e, uh, e5 move will kind of, you know, if you, if you do nothing. So what would you do instead, Zoe? Okay. This, this is all about you. It's not about me. I know it's a very hard concept for me to understand because I'm like, me, me, me. So what would you play here as as white? So you don't like G5, even though it looks like a very... I mean, it helps that you have the eval bar on, and the eval bar hated it, but okay. Uh <laughs> yeah, I think G5 was okay. I think G5 was okay. Um... <clears throat> I mean, bear in mind that the eval bar is, is ne necessary on a very strong set, so it's, it takes a while for it to catch up. But I guess if you do go E5, you're giving up the D5 square, right? Yeah, but then black can quickly take on c3, play knight e7, d5. Um, 
So G5. It makes some sense to me, actually. Um, Wait. Okay, no, maybe that doesn't work. I was just wondering whether there's some kind of King B1 preparing a sacrifice on B5. But Yeah, I mean, moves like that. It's funny, actually, because John Nunn, I was reading this uh, uh, Nigel Short book, and John, he was talking about how John Nunn always used to hate playing King B1 in the Sicilian because he felt like it was a clear waste of a tempo. So it's all about coaching, actually. You know, why is coaching relevant? I mean, a lot of people might argue that co chess coaching isn't relevant. And, you know, they might well have a point. I think where it maybe is relevant is stuff like that, because you're imparting some wisdom, you know, and you're learning stuff from people who are experienced. Yeah, I just, I want to make Knight takes b5 work, right? But obviously at the moment it doesn't because you take on d2 yeah. a check. So my idea was whether I could play king b1. Because if you don't do anything, I'm going to take on b5. Ah, oh, right. Okay, that's interesting. But if I go here... But yeah, I think three... I think e5 is the problem. It doesn't really stop that. So it's not really the, like, it's not doing anything prophylactically. Yeah, it's just yeah. trying to set... Uh, but that was just something I was thinking about. So the question is after this, why doesn't it think this move why isn't this move working anyway i guess there's a tactical reason or maybe it's also possible to go e5 actually bit of a tricky bit of a tough position i mean i mean, I mean i'm guessing that neither player was particularly familiar with this kind of setup but magnus is probably one of the even though you know he's a phenomenal end game player and very strong player in general and he relies a lot on his natural talent He's also one of the best prepared chess players in history. You know, he's got a yeah. phenomenal team behind him. He, you know, he's got a phenomenal memory. So I wouldn't Can be surprised. Can I if... ask a question about the position? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it's not in... how coaching works. You're not allowed to ask questions. You mean me, me. It's all about coaching. <laughs> Instead of G5, can we play A3? Yeah, yeah. That's a very sensible move, actually. Um, I'm just Maybe. trying to take the sting out of e5. Yeah. And then the idea is if you take on c3, obviously I will take back with the bishop, and then again, e5 is not really. Yeah. But the thing is, um, you know, I mean, if you look at it from, yeah, I mean, it's probably a good move, a3. So if I go back, okay, let's say I go bishop f8, actually. Bishop f8 might be good. No, it hates that move. Well, but now, oh. hang on. I was just, yeah. What happens if I... Uh, what happens if I go here? No, that's also bad. Yeah, I was wondering whether B4 works, yeah. No, hang on, I've got an idea. I'll go here. <laughs> ah, yeah, that might be a better move, because now I've got Bishop F4 ideas. But yeah, I mean, the thing is, you can't consider all these ideas in the game. Yeah, the idea is just to take the sting out of E5, so that... You wouldn't yeah. have the bishop still attacking c3. That was just my a3, idea. A3 is a very sensible move. I mean, it's a good suggestion. Um, but in the game, we went g5, which, you know, is an aggressive move if you're black, you know, from black's point of view, you have to react very accurately because, you know, your pieces are on the back rank. Yeah, but why and can't I you just play e5 anyway, like you were saying? Yeah, I think there's, yeah, e5, maybe just something like this. I don't know. No, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, if you do that, do we not just take on c3? I think you can take it, actually, because you can always hide with your king to f8. But you could also take on c3, because if you take on c7, we take on d2, check, and then take on c7. And then yeah. if you play... Yeah, yeah. And then if you play queen yeah, takes, so... then you take on b6, and you don't even get d7. Yeah, yeah. Um, Maybe just... Um, is, is it possible to take... No, I keep blundering here. I'm not a very good coach, am I? I just <laughs> maybe you're coaching me. <laughs> maybe Bishop here. Yeah, I mean some sensible move. I sometimes get carried away. Yeah, yeah and it was just the question was whether like you take on C three and then you have to play yeah. B B takes C three and then does Black. I think, if black, I think if black could take and then go knight E seven and D five and castles. Yeah, that's what is, I wanted to do. Yeah. 
The problem is that here eventually White will take on F6 and go Rook G1. And that is uncomfortable for Black. You know, so this is maybe what he was slightly concerned about. So he went for H6, which, you know, is not a move I would necessarily even consider because it looks like it's provoking White. But, it's, you know, in, in a way it makes a lot of sense. Because if you take on F6, I take back. If you take, I have the two bishops. Uh, control over the dark squares. My king is fairly, even though my king is in the center, it's fairly safe for the time being. Um, and if you don't take, I'm going to castle and claim the rook is good on the F file. So, or maybe put, even put the king on F7. I don't know. But, um, or even play E5 and then castle. Could white play rook G1 now? Yeah, I mean, rook G1 would make a lot of sense, yeah. yeah. I mean, this is another line they could have gone for. Um, but um, maybe uh, castles, maybe there's a, after queen H6, there's a good reply. No, maybe not. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd be slightly concerned here. As maybe E5 here, actually, would make a bit of sense. Uh, yeah, so maybe you would have to take on F6 straight away and just... I mean, it's possible to play like this. I mean, uh, probably the whole opening is a mess, you know. And um, but in the game, he played slightly differently. He took this way, which also makes some sense. He went a three. Uh, black took, so that was a very uh, aggressive decision. And then he went for e five. So he's trying to open up the white king. And and now Magnus. Um, Move. What would you play here as as Black Zoe? Does it actually? Uh, there's only one move here that's uh, apparently okay for Black. I think, from what I remember looking at the game. And can you just go over the last couple of moves again so I can think about yeah. if he had a plan when he did them? So he takes on a three and then goes e ah then goes e five. So if the bishop moves, you take on c three. So then okay, so that makes sense. So then why is that? Magnus didn't play a very good move here. He didn't. No. Well, I mean, not according to the uh, engine evaluation, anyway. But of course, the engine isn't always right. Okay, this might be really stupid, but... Okay, no, it is really stupid. Ignore me. <laughs> What's that? No, I was just dropping stuff for nothing. Ignore. Well, what were you thinking? I was going to say d5, and then if you take with a pawn, bishop takes, because you can't take with a queen, because of queen takes c2. That was really c2. played in the game. That but then be... I think it's really bad because of um, the bishop b5. That's what happened in the game. But d5 is not necessarily a bad move um, from a practical point of view because you, you but, um, you know, from a theoretical point of view, it's a very risky decision, you know. But obviously you're, he's adjusting his play depending on the opponent. And we've seen that him do that in the past in Vikans A, for example, against uh, Van Welly, he played the Benko Gambit. You know, against certain opponents, he'll play a more risky way because he understand that, mm. you know. Oh, actually. Just... Is... Mm. So black to play, what is the best move? <clears throat> no, it's probably absolutely terrible, though. Yeah. I was going to say, is there some kind of weird knight g4 where if they take, you play bishop takes e4 and you hit c2 and... Um, H1 at the same play, time. It's not a weird tactic. It's not a weird tactic. It's, it's not really a tactic. I mean, D5 is more of a tactic. <laughs> the move played in the game, right? Because you're going for some kind of, yeah, counter from the, on the queen side. You're just trying to open up. I mean, so you're hitting a random button, and you can do that in chess. Sometimes you hit the random button. I was thinking that... Um... So we don't. I don't think he wants to castle yet because that was just running into rook g one. But I was thinking, trying to think about worst place piece, and I don't like the position of this knight on h six. So maybe yeah. we could try knight f seven. Knight f seven was apparently a better move, and the reason I think one of the reasons is. That you're not necessarily afraid of bishop b5 as much as you are allowing it to check, and also you need to consolidate something on 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 the um, on the king side to some degree. So let's say you went, I don't know, rook g1, which would be a natural move attacking g7. 
how would you proceed? Well, my idea was to try and stick the knight on g5. Why immediately? Um, why not? Let's give it a go. Oh, is that is that running into some bishop e5 tactic actually? I don't like knight g5 immediately. It might be okay. I mean, yeah, I knight, like knight... knight g5 does. Yeah, no. I was wondering whether it runs into bishop e5. Um. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's something you have to consider. Yeah. Yeah, it looks kind of dangerous to go knight g5. Also, maybe rook g5 first takes and. Yeah, okay. So, I, mean, I maybe, don't like No, that. but it might still be okay. I mean, for example, knight g5, rook g5, f g5, bishop e5, queen e5, queen d7, king f8, queen b7, queen a1 check, king b2, you have queen c3. And you've got a lot of count play. And then if king e2, you have rook takes h2, and it's probably going to be. Force mate, bishop g2, rook takes g2, king f1, queen takes f3, king e1, queen f2, mate. Yeah, I did uh, not follow that. <laughs> Can you put those yeah. moves on the board? Just grandmaster G5. analysis. Yeah. So can you put? Can you quickly go through that line? Yeah, it was, it was something like this, and it, this didn't quite work because of. Um, here we have check. Maybe you can go rook h2, but the point is, check. you can't go back to c1 because of mate. We have to go yeah. here. We have this, and now this is forced mate. That was so impressive, you saw. <laughs> yeah. That's Maybe what I incredible. Work. Incredible. So, does bishop e5 work straight away, or is it the same problem? I guess it's going to probably be the same sort of thing. But the thing is, I think, I mean, you can't, yeah, you can't probably can go knight g5 actually. Um, it's certainly a much better way to play, actually, than, than what looking at. Yeah, I mean, the engine doesn't seem to hate it. Um, and the thing is, after bishop b5, maybe you could even just castle because then queen b7 is allowing queen c2. And if bishop b7, then you might be running into a like a rook b8 problem. Yeah, and then you're throwing knight f3 and stuff. I think the position is just very messy. And maybe sensing that he lost control. He decided just to hit the randomized button with d5. Um, so check was played. Uh, this is actually one thing when I was watching the broadcast of Nakamura, he criticized the amount of time that Randelius was spending. You know, he said that really, you know, from a practical point of view, you throw in bishop b5 and then you start thinking. So here, um, black to play, uh, white to play. What is the best way for White to try and consolidate his advantage? Okay, so Black's maybe threatening to take on e4. Yep. And we can't take on... Well, if we take on d5 ourselves, there's bishop takes d5. Which looks a bit annoying. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, again, you know, the thing is... I'm watching this game, and like everybody else, you can see the engine evaluation. You can see what the engine suggests. But over the board, you know, this is what people fail to realise. Over the board, you know, they're not machines. They're going to make mistakes. Yeah. And okay. Carlson understands this. And maybe against somebody with a slightly higher rate, maybe a Ding Lirin or someone, or a Ferozia, maybe he wouldn't play like this as black because he'd be like, you know, the guy would find the moves, maybe, you know. Um, but whoever you're playing, they're going to make mistakes. I have so, a couple of possible suggestions. I'm not sure how good they are, but one would be queen b4 check, and when the king moves, go queen b3. So you pin that pawn to the king. <laughs> you still defend c2. Are you sure you haven't seen this game? I haven't seen it, no. Well, that was actually the best suggestion, yeah. That's what was. See, why can't I do this in my own games? I don't get it. Like, when I'm streaming with you as well, I can find all this really good stuff, and then I just can't do it in my own games. Well, yeah, maybe it's, it's psychological reasons, but... Because that yeah. was my first thought, and then if that didn't work, I was also considering maybe a4 to try and go bishop a3, but then I like the idea of putting the queen on b3, because it pins the pawn. And then yeah, yeah, if yeah. they do well, get out of that pin and move the pawn in the future, you prepare rook d7 as well. That was the well, other technically, idea. Technically, that was winning for Wyatt. But I think... See, I Brandy... could have beaten Carlson if I'd been. Well, there's still work to be done even after... <laughs> yeah, I'm joking. I'm joking. But... I mean, it's still, it's still... I mean, even, you know, 
even if Grandidius had found that, he's not certain to win the game. But it, it would have been very unpleasant. But he went bishop a4, it was quite a bad move. I don't like that. So what would you play after bishop a4? Okay, so obviously we've got to consider the obvious d takes e4. I think that's an obvious move to consider. Um, yeah. But also, moves like d4 seem kind of interesting. Um, to shut off that dark, because then you say that okay, you can't play a four and get that bishop to about a diagonal, and now you like shut off their bishop well, in the a, game. That was a move played in the game, and again, it's prophylaxis in a way because the bishop on on b two is. Um, but there's other lines that you would have had. So you did spend some time here, Carlson. There's other lines with a character like queen here. I think taking is a little bit uh, iffy because you can go here. Maybe it was the computer thinks that was a forced win. Oh, no, maybe you it's queen. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, which was the move. I w yeah, which is <laughs> one of the other ideas I was thinking about. The other, yeah, yeah okay, yeah. So, but so yeah, d four. Yeah. I like d four because it shuts the bishop out of the game, and also it stops the rook coming down to d seven. And but I think I think at least from a practical point of view, this is now better for black because the piece is a core knight. You know, this Do is we Carson... have a plan of going knight f seven, knight d six, as well yeah. now. It but this is the way Carlson plays chess, is he plays for long-term advantages. And even though in the short-term, Black's position is a little bit shaky with the king on f8, in the long-term, this pawn structure is very, very sound. So you can imagine in a situation where the knight ends up taking on f3 in an endgame, e4 collapses. It could very well be very easily winning for Black. Yeah. Um, I think so... my next move for Black would be knight f7, to be honest. Yeah, I think that's what I'm in the game. So we got something like this, and um, kind of interesting position was was played. Uh, rook b8, and uh, he went here, and uh, bishop here. Oh, Russian way. Repeat once. Yeah. So they've actually had that a couple of times, actually. They had, they had cut that same position a couple of times. But he went rook h3. And um, so he's trying to... He did think about it. So he's obviously considering the possibility of taking the draw. But Magnus tends to... But now he's back. threatening to move the bishop and then take on b3. Exactly, yeah. So white took. And then it gets very interesting now because he went here. So in this position... Um, there's there's a good move here for black. What's the best move here for black? There's some nice tactics around about here from what I recall. But this is a tough position. I mean, this is, I mean, you know, they, they got this position slightly wrong. Um, it's a no hope for me then. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you found um, you found queen b4 to b3 earlier. You also found that, that just so. that seemed quite obvious to me, but okay. Yeah, but you also found that so maybe you're already stronger than Magnus. <laughs> <laughs> so he goes. Yeah, but this the point is I wouldn't play it in my own games. I see the stuff and so then I've I... changed my mind. I'll only defend my world title <laughs> against Berugia or Zoe Varney. <laughs> I wish. So okay, so extending the list. <laughs> well, I'm trying to think obvious time. I mean. The most forcing moves, I guess, to start with would be moving that bishop away somewhere. Because mm. if the queen moves, then you can take on b3 because of the pawn pinned. So... So what um, happens after after this move? What happens after this move? Well, Good presumably move. white would have to take on f7, right? Or isn't... Because if you move the queen, I just take on b3. Or are you going to go like queen a4 and if I take on b3 you want to take on a6? Is that your point? Sorry? But... Well, I was thinking... Because I was like, surely I thought you'd have to just take on f7. But then I was wondering if your point was that you could maybe go queen a4 and if we take on b3 you take on a6. But... The rook takes b2? Yeah, so that's why I was confused when I was like, isn't bishop f7 the only move? No, no, if you believe in your analysis, you know, you don't have to, um, you don't have to ask me to hold your hand every time. <laughs> you know, that's the whole point of becoming a good player, you're independent. <laughs> Bishop F7 is correct, but now, what does Black play?
Do you just move your king, and then if queen a4, go bishop b5? But where would you move the king to, though? Uh, h8. Yeah. Well, the thing is, uh, if you take on f7 with queen, then b8. Then yeah, yeah, and if you take with the king, then you're allowing rook f2 ideas, right? Well, actually, after here, what well, has this move. And then coming down. This yeah. Is cool. This is still something that's similar happened in the game, actually. Um, so after bishop takes f7, do you play king h8? With and the then... idea, yeah. So I think this is this is an important part of your character. This is where maybe you can't... Because play... they can't go queen c4 or queen b3. So this is what I was saying. And if they go queen a4, yeah. hitting your bishop, you go yeah. bishop b5. But can I just say, um, this is a good sign that you're finding these moves. So I think it's very important... Uh, when you're calculating to not think superficially, to try and go deeply with your lines, be able to uh, calculate sharp positions. I think when people are training to be good at chess, uh, one of the ways you can um, get better at chess and better at your calculation is to calculate sharp positions. You know, to really look deeply into the, into you know, that's what top players do. Yeah, I was so, just trying to calculate the line queen a4, Bishop b5, queen back. Do you think you would find this in the game? Like, if, if would you see this variation in the game after bishop f7, king h8? In fact, that you know that there's something here. I think that's helped you. Or do you think that? You know, I think um, knowing, yeah, I think you. I think because otherwise you'd automatically think about king f7. I mean, obviously, I wouldn't play queen f7. I'm not that stupid. But I think the fact that you were like, okay, now what? That got me thinking, hang on a minute. Can I just move my king? Yeah, yeah. And then queen a4, bishop b5. The What I was struggling to calculate was then queen b... Yeah, bishop b5, queen back to b4. Yeah. And then my point was that now, if I take on f7, you might have a4. So do we throw in another bishop move? Um... So we do. Yeah, yeah, a4 is a good, good, good idea. But I think also the other. But also, problem... actually, no, there's maybe queen a2 or something. I don't know. I was just yeah, trying to calculate. There's stuff, like, there's stuff like this, which is quite dangerous for white. There's actually a very clever move that white has here. I don't know if you can find it. Um, After bishop a6, a very nice move here, which is pointed out by Benjamin Bock on the um, <laughs> Nakamura stream. Him being very good at puzzle rush. There's yeah, nice he's move. he's very good. There's a very nice move here for white. It's not obvious. Well, even then, black is maybe still doing well, even after the move. Okay, let me think. Um... Wait, is there rook g3? Yeah. With the idea that if you take, we take back. And then obviously if you take our queen, we have rook h2 check. And then if you yeah. take our queen straight away, we have oh, rook mate, takes h3. Mate, mate in that. But after rook g3... You, you just move, you line. just retreat your rook rate right, instead. To where? Um... Can you go rook h6 and then you actually defend a6? Yeah, then you can bring the yeah, then you can bring the rook over to b6. So it's still apparently better for black. So I, I don't know, it's a mess. But I think the ability <laughs> to, to to be able to see all these forcing variations, I think that's a key part of chess mastery. And the, you know, the more you practice this, Zoe, you know, the better you, stronger you. Uh, yeah, I think the issue up. is I see them when I'm doing this stuff with you, and. If I'm like over the board, you get maybe nervous. And... Yeah, I don't know. I just don't see it over you, the board. You, you sort of like so maybe um, it's a competitive.
that you're not very comfortable. I was actually saying this earlier. You know, I was actually thinking a lot of people get excited and um, they get really like, you know, really pumped up and they get really emotional. And I'm actually like the opposite. I couldn't care less. And that's probably an advantage in chess. The only times I really seem to care is when I lose and I get really angry. <laughs> so it's like I'm really lazy to the point where I lose and I get really, really sad. But yeah, I mean, I don't really care. But a lot of the times, and I think that's an advantage. So maybe you need to just not care. You know, maybe you care too much. This is a problem. But yeah, going back to this, this is obviously a very difficult game. Magnus played Bishop E2, which is a good move, um, but not as good as Bishop A6. So uh, yeah, and then, then we got this line Queen A4 and um, Rook G2, star move, very clever move. Um, so that Black or white has his can't play rook g7. And it doesn't seem to be any way that black can be better now. He went rook h7. And um, yeah, I think actually this was a key moment. What what I think there's one um white played in the game was a was a mistake. So what should white play in this position? Okay. Well, not the necessarily a losing mistake. Bobby uh, still had very good drawing chances. I mean, I, the game's still going on, so I don't really know what's happening. I see that actually if there's been any more moves. So I suppose Black's threatening to go. Bishop d3. Yeah. So I'd consider p playing. And that now it seems to be heading to a draw. <clears throat> It's a difficult one because I mean you can't go king d two because of rook h two, right? Yeah. But so then should... I feel like you kind of want to move the king away, so or maybe maybe you so have you... some kind of rook g three actually, um, rook g three to stop bishop b three and bishop d three. But then yeah. maybe well... black could still consider moves like pawn to d three at some point. But yeah. But, I want to go uh, rook, D, rook g3 followed by h4, h5. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, if black ever goes d3, then e5 is... We yeah. But yeah, rook, my plan would be rook g3, h4, h5. So you want to go this rook back to No, d4. no, no. That, why are we moving that rook to g3? Oh, because if I go the other rook to g3, then there's... You play... Yeah, you then go bishop d3 anyway. Yeah, because then if I take you... Yeah, so like that, yeah, yeah, it has to be the you sick front crook back to g3. And so, yeah, I'm not... not as Maybe king b1 was... Yeah, was, yeah I, was the move I, was thinking I forgot that, so. that you couldn't... I thought I was thinking about moving the first one. I forgot you couldn't move that one. But yeah, I think moving the king is better than me. If you push this, then I can even just take and hide my king and then, you know, I'm going to have enough counterplay with e5 being so weak. Um, so you just think again, you, you're continuing on the same theme of prophylaxis, yeah. Uh, but in the game, white went rook g5 actually, which was a slight mistake, and then black had um, so we got to this position, there's still playing, but apparently it's now fizzling out to a draw. Um, so but yeah, there were some interesting moments in that game that were worthy of analysis, and I feel like. If you can understand those moments. So you did fairly well on those, actually. You did pretty well on I was actually surprised how well you did. I was expecting you to fail every single one. <laughs> you have so and much confidence in me. But Should we move is, on to this... the next one? Um or do you want to keep talking about this for a little bit? I was just gonna say that yeah. I thought the the thing is I don't know how to deal with obviously you yes, my coach you got help is the fact that I find it frustrating that when I'm doing analysis like this or i'm doing commentary with you or whatever i can mm. find really good moves and actually find them pretty quickly and yeah. see some good lines and stuff but then yeah. i can't do it on my own games and okay i know i understand like blitz games yeah 
I'm not really expecting to be able to see all that, but if I can see it that quickly in analysis and commentary, then why can't I see it in standard play games? That's what I'm finding really frustrating, and I don't know how it to may fix. It may come down to lack of confidence. So you haven't got to that point now yet where you're confident enough or you feel uncomfortable with the board. Maybe in certain games you do. You know, I've seen you do that in certain games, but where I feel like you're in a comfort zone. When you're playing like a cocky little junior... You seem to fall apart. <laughs> I don't understand how. So, you know, and you're probably a much stronger player than them in a, in a lot of cases. But you, you fall apart because you just somehow you... But I do think you've got weakness in your game as well. There's certain positions where you've, you're comfortable. But I've, I've never like... played these positions for either side before. And I managed to find things. Yeah, yeah. But in sharp, tactical, forcing positions, you're, you're pretty good. But, you know... This is what your chess is, is good. Where you often fall down, and I'll notice that in your games, you know, pointing that out to you, is sometimes you lack patience, you know, and, <laughs> and you know, yeah. But shall we move on to the next game? Yeah, we've spent 40 minutes on that. Did you that still was too want, long. We're just going to quickly... want to do... Okay. We'll, we'll quickly just... We'll, we'll, we'll just do one position on each game. Okay, that sounds good. And... Then it'll be much easier rather than just going through the whole game. We're just going to do. So I think this it, game, it was instructive that I enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah. So, disposition, black to play. What is the um, correct move for play? Okay. Bishop c3 is considered to be a slightly inaccurate move. I mean, I suppose he's trying to throw it in Bishop a5. Exactly. A, a lot of reviewers might be familiar with this position because this is from the uh, Vikings A tournament, which is going on at the moment. And this is Magnus in the first round against Mr. Esipenko from Russia, who he lost to in the pre previous edition of Tat Steel. But he's obviously wary of um, Andre Esipenko, a very uh, strong young Russian player. But he has shown a bit of fragility in this tournament, Esipenko. He's not looked very convincing to me. Yeah, maybe times. I'm too tactical a player, but my first thought here is C4. The idea of bishop a5, you take on b3, and if bishop c7, we take on c2, and then bishop d8, and then pawn takes um, d1 check. But uh, c4, can I meet that with um, bishop a5, c, b, queen b3. I think this is one of the things with calculation you could work. I mean, even though your calculation is good, you see interesting lines. Because uh, then we can't take on c1 because you just play... You, you've got to consider alternatives. You know, Ben Larson said that uh, calculation is... I mean, long variations are always wrong. And what he meant by that is... You know, the longer the variation, the more chance of, you know, well, probably meant several things by that. But what I'm in theory is that he meant that, you know, the longer the cat, the longer the variation, the more, um, you know, there's deviation in the variation. So you look at a, a certain line, you know, strong players will often look at, you know, a long forcing line. For example, that line I showed you in the previous game where I saw very quickly, but it was all forcing moves. Yeah, you know there was no, there's no way to deviate, so that's different. But you know positions where they can deviate, you have to be careful. So that's why sometimes it can be useful as well to check your variations and not just assume that you know the right answer. You know. Yeah, because I get you now. So c4, bishop a5, cb, yeah. queen b, and then if we go rook c1, you take on d8 because if you take on change. d1, yeah. there's queen d1. Yeah. You were we were talking just now about um, you have you know good understanding and good calculation but certain positions you're not very experienced in and you often go wrong this position is black because i play these kind of positions myself you know nimzo indian queens indian and i've studied them you know another thing that's very important is understanding you know classical games from the past and everything there's a move here for black which is very thematic which which any Queen's Indian player would, would understand it is an idea in the position. But clearly you do not. So <laughs> we're starting to see why you're, you're not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I just try and think too tactically, I suppose. Um... Well, this movie is quite tactical.
I think you're right. I just don't understand the position at all. <laughs> well, it's, it's a typical breakthrough move in the Queen's India, which is well, like D four or something. Yeah, because I did consider D four because you open up the bishop, but yeah. then I just sort of discounted it because. I don't know why. I just discounted it. Well, I mean, obviously Magnus might have considered this as well, but he didn't play it. Now, he should have played it. And I guess the reason is, well, the first thing, not necessarily af afraid of this because Flat then has a chance. Of yeah, the yeah, exactly. Option. But the movie I'd be afraid of is Bishop A5. You think, well, you know, I could look very silly if I just lose the exchange. Yeah, uh, that's a... why I discounted it, basically. Yeah. And he probably would have discounted the same reason, so don't beat yourself up. But um, bishop takes f3. So the question is, how do you evaluate this position after knight e5? It's a very good move hitting the knight. Bishop. Yeah, yeah. How do you evaluate it? Well, the end. Well, I'm giving it kind of giving it away by the engine. But it's always, always important, I think, as well to have the ability to evaluate. Yeah, you know, talked about this with you, Zoe, and the ability to evaluate. Yeah. So can I just check? Can we not take on f3 before taking on c7, or is that? Really terrible. Well, can the king hide on e2 then? Maybe, maybe that's the um, knight f3 does king g2 now? Yeah, but then knight h4. But then I can go back to f1, yeah? Feels like you're losing control. You know, you, you want. The computer oh, no, likes f4. <laughs> the computer agrees with me. In here? <laughs> no, no, hold on. Oh, knight takes. Oh, okay. So, yeah, maybe now I've losing even stronger, right? Does that make me better than you yet? Probably. So, I was looking at the other side. I was thinking the, the evaluation bot was favoring white, but clearly not. You know, I, yeah. But anyway, yeah, this is a uh, very dangerous position for clearly very dangerous position. And even queen takes, is this not very good comp? Um, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't like my queen takes. Prefers, yeah, prefers your move knight takes. So, how does that work? Oh, because of knight h4. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is a very dead, but it's not easy to see over the board. To be fair, and because it was the first round, and obviously he's playing somebody who considers a dangerous opponent, he lost him last year. He decided, right, I'm just gonna. One thing I noticed with Magnus as well is he generally doesn't deviate from the the grand plan. You know, he plays with great positional understanding, mm. and he plays by position. What do I mean by play by? By position. This is like a Russian term. Play by position. What, what do I mean by that? So he understands different positions and like. No, no that's not. I don't, what I don't. <laughs> what, what's meant by play by position is you're not changing anything, you're not sacrificing, you, you're kind of keeping the position as it is. So you're letting the position develop. And I think that's something you could work on as well, because I don't think you do enough of that. Let the position develop, you know, and I think that's a lot of uh, thing, the problem that amateur players have um, is they try to play too aggressively at times and they don't have the patience of someone like Magnus who can just play a lot of moves and just let the position develop like a fine wine, you know? <laughs> so... Queen e7 is very Magnus because it's just playing by position. But it happened to be that d4 was actually in that particular situation was very dangerous. So you have to have that ability to play by position, but you obviously you have to have that ability to change gears. Um, you know, and that's what makes chess a difficult game because, you know, it all depends on the position. But, yeah. uh, okay, so basically what happened was they just repeated. He decided, right, I don't want to take the risk. Very, very wimpy, but... Of course, now if you go um, if you go for this, it's it's not as effective because the rook is blocked by the bishop. Uh, sorry, bishop's blocked by the rook. So yeah. So so that example we didn't find d4, but you saw the idea. So that was something at least. I mean, it wasn't an easy. Uh, I mean, Magnus didn't see it. He didn't find it. So it's not an easy. So we're going to move on to the final example. Okay. Show you today. So yeah, I think one of the things I recommend anybody who's like you know got an interest in coaching, you know, I'm not like you know a famous chess coach by any means or anything like that. I'm probably a much better player than I am a coach. Uh, but one of the things I would say um, for coaching is find out, understand what you, your um, student needs to work on, and then find examples to show them. 
I just tend to find random examples. You know, but <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, you, so identify weakness in your play. So, for example, in your play, I understand that your weakness is maybe that you don't play enough by position, um, that you have certain lack of understanding in certain positions, you know, so you don't understand a D4 breakthrough, for example. So I could find some examples with a D4 breakthrough. I could find examples where Magnus play very positionally and strategically and show you those kind of examples and test you on those examples. But, you know, anyway, blabbing on as usual. So this game was, um, yeah, interesting game, actually. Funny enough, I was looking at some kind of theory like this um, earlier. It was a slightly different line, but um it was actually with knight c3 and then knight c6 bishop b5 knight d4 bishop here e6 knight e2 a6 no not a6 sorry knight f6 castles knight c6 so i had a game against the engine where it went knight c6 and after d3 it went a6 and it maybe went a6 before so he went a6, and then after d3, then he went b5, and then he went knight c6. That's right, yeah. And somehow I like resigned very quickly because I allowed d5 and I got crushed and I decided to just give up. But, you know, that's one of the ways you can improve as well is to play against engines in training games, in openings that you find interesting and see how the computer plays those positions. I mean, I'm guessing that's what you do a lot, Zoe, as well, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've uh, been trying to train the openings I've been working on. I try and ask the com I like, make the computer play those lines and then see what yeah. it does. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, you know, if, if we're talking about how to use computers in a useful way for an amateur player, um, obviously the top players in the world, Zoe, you know, they're using computers in a very sophisticated way. They're looking at sort of, and new neural networks online, neural engines online and stuff, you know, like AI stuff, very sophisticated. But, you know, from a basic level, you could just play against the um, default engine on chess.com and, you know, learn the opening that way. But, um, sorry, going back to the game, I'm just going to get to the critical position rather than blabbing on too much. And what the hell happened there? But obviously, if you take, then White's going to get phenomenal attack down the e-file or very good compensation so yeah i mean i would guess both players went wrong around about this point um and i think the reason is i mean ravi's a very good player i think his opponent's quite a strong player um is because it's an unusual position you know they don't really you know that's often where players will go wrong is because the position is slightly weird and unusual. So in this position, what would you play as white? I mean, the first move I'd even consider is bishop takes h7. Wow, really? Yeah. But how would you calculate that? So don't take me through your calculations. So bishop h7, king h7, knight g5. Yeah, because obviously if king g8, queen h5... Um, and then you can't go bishop f5 to defend because we can just take it with the knight. Yeah. Um, so it's basically a great gift that works, right? Yeah, so you just win. So bishop h7 wins, in your opinion. Well, no, if they go to g8, it does. So then, I mean, I said it, it's like the first year. So bishop h7, king h7, knight g5. So then I'd need to consider king g6 and king h6, yeah. and that's when I normally start to struggle a bit. Um, so what happens after King G6? I guess one idea is to go H4. But then if we go H8? Yeah, because we... just an idea, actually. I mean, I didn't say it wins. I just said it's the first thing I'd consider. Yeah, no, it's an interesting idea. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, but I think... Um... I think the problem is, Zoe, that the bishop on c1 is not in the game at the moment. Yeah, if the pawn was already on like d4 or something, because then the bishop yeah. would help. That might be a much more G5. dangerous idea. Because um, then you might have some kind of knight. Yeah, that might be a, a more sensible idea. But I think with the bishop on c1, that kind of bishop h7 is not going to work. 
But I like the way you're looking at forcing moves. I think there's something that you have to you have to look at forcing moves. If, if, you know, during your games, it's a very important part of calculation is to look at forcing lines. Um, is there any other? So we we we've established Bishop H7 probably doesn't work. Are there any other moves? Well, after discounting that, I would then look at Knight G5. It's still quite forcing. So I'm establishing with you. you <laughs> I like go, attacking. You just go for like random hacks, regardless of. <laughs> So maybe you need to become like, more sophisticated. It's, it's nice to have that in your locker. You know, the way I see it, you've got that in your locker. You've got that ability to attack. You know, this is the way the top players, they've all got the ability. I mean, Magnus has got the ability to be a caveman if he wants to be. Yeah. He generally doesn't He doesn't draw upon it unless he needs to, or he draws upon it from a position of strength. Same with Carpo. These guys were probably mad hackers. Paul Fanderson, who was, um, you know, considered a very boring positional player by some, and would generally... You know, go for he was like a prototype Magnus. You generally go for a lot of end games. Was was a mad hacker in his youth, apparently. So, you know, they've got their ability, but you don't want to start necessarily start from that point always. You know, you sometimes you want to also have that ability. Okay, um, I mean, my next suggestions would be d three or d four, but then it's still a kind of hacky thing if I want the queen on d three. <laughs> yeah, well. Okay, apparently a move like A4 would have been reasonable, which is a quite a, quite a hard move. To you know what's really interesting is A4 was actually the very first move I thought of here, but I immediately discounted it because B5 is um, not a threat. Yeah, but I think you're going positionally with Bishop A3, and then you can go like B5. Because I literally then... considered that possibility, but then just discounted it. <laughs> and I was like, because I was looking at trying to make um, that work. And then I was like, okay, A4 is too slow because B5 is not working. And then I was looking at Bishop A3 first, then B5, but then it doesn't work. Yeah. So maybe, maybe we <laughs> And then I started looking at hacking attacks instead. Well, this is why we established that maybe you're, um, even though you've got very good instinct for the right move, you haven't got the confidence behind it. So this is maybe the reason why you're not playing these moves in your game. Maybe you're seeing them the right. I have this problem myself. You know, sometimes I, if I'm if I haven't played for a long time, and or just generally, you know, I often see the right move, and I look for the game after. So oh, you know, I saw that move. That was the first move that came to my mind. Why didn't I play it? Just lack the confidence, or you know. Or for whatever reason. Yeah, because the weirdest thing here is like that was genuinely the first move I thought of, but then I just discounted it so quickly I didn't even mention it to you because I felt I'd be stupid for suggesting yeah. it. Okay, well, don't be stupid. <laughs> the whole point of coaching is you're not supposed to ever feel stupid. That's the whole point <laughs> of coaching, right? Um, but why I play D3, which is a very natural move, it's actually a bad move but for a particular reason. There's a specific reason why that's a bad move. So the question is now, well, we could even flip the board. Um, why is that a bad move? So black to play. I mean, okay, I need to stop saying the first thing. Well, am I supposed to just tell you the first move I think of? Yeah, well, if you want to. Yeah, well, the fine. first move I'd think of is knight f5. Because it's, I was trying to think, okay, it's so a d3, like, blocks the bishop off from that square. And if you take, then after bishop takes, like we can get rid of the light squad bishops quite easily. Um, so that's, that's the first move I think. Right. Okay. What happens after knight f five? Uh, knight f five. Bishop takes. D c four. Bishop c two. Queen c two. D c four. Queen e four. Isn't that, isn't that a problem? Because hang on, then, hang on. Can you? <laughs> so you so you're saying, saying knight f five. Knight f five. Bishop f five. D C four, Bishop C two, Queen C two, D C four, Queen E four. Yeah, because you can't go B five because C six is hanging. You okay. could go you could go Queen D six G three B five, but then there's Bishop F four. And then you're starting to run into problems like Queen D seven, Rook D one. Yeah. And okay. if Queen C eight and Queen takes C six. But you have Queen D three after Queen E four. But then maybe your D pawn's weak. I can say go Rook D one. D pool might be very weak, like rook d8. You know, it looks unpleasant for for, for black. Also, after knight f5, dc4 immediately is probably quite decent. Yeah. But there's like a specific tactic, you know, and I think this comes down to. I mean, another uh, move I'd consider here is d4, but. d4 was the move that black should have played, yeah. Because then you're trying to undermine like the b4 pawn as well as the d4 square and stuff. But after d4. 
I take with a pawn, what do you play? So this is a key follow-up. You have to understand and see the key follow-up. which again is kind of a thematic idea in a way. That was a draw in the end, yeah. Never mind. Never mind, Magnus. Uh, C3. Exactly, that's the move, yeah, C3. And um, so how would you assess this position? Well, obviously, I like the fact that the it's going to take a couple of, like, to be able to get the dark squared bishop doing something good, white would have to move the E3 knight away first, which is a shame because the knight on E3 looks quite nice. Um... And even then, it's difficult yeah, to find again, a square for again, the bishop. Again, but also, you shut off yeah. the light square. You shut off the um, b1 yeah. to h7 diagonal. And then you're yeah, yeah. going to play knight takes b4. I, I could argue your answer is too long. I don't think you need... I think basically... <laughs> I just know. go, I think this is minus 0.6. No, no. Because you've got an evil really bar really up and I know it. In human way, human terms, but um you know like what would what would bobby fisher say about this position he, you know he fought in very strong term you know clear clear thinking and very clear thinking right he just say like the bishop on c2 is shut down pawn on c3 drives a wedge into position black is clearly better that would tell he would assess the position and he'd probably be right you know so it's just more a positional strategic uh idea and you've got to have those kind of ideas in your locker. I think you've got to have, you know, I feel like um, strength in chess, so is a lot about options, having the ability to see options. The more options you see, um, you know, the stronger you become. So, like, a really strong player would see that as an option. You know, they would understand that maybe White's a little bit uncomfortable when you open because it doesn't really um, experience in this kind of position. You know, and it's an unusual position. It's difficult to play. And he plays d3, which is actually a blunder. Um, it's a strategic blunder because now black has the opportunity to go d4. You know, he's, 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 he didn't see the possibility, probably didn't see the possibility of playing black playing. Rabbi didn't see the possibility of black playing d4, is my guess. Is that what his opponent did? Sorry? Is that what his opponent did? No. So I found a better move than his opponent. Yeah, he played B5. The guy was like 2,400. This isn't the European team championships, right? Which I think you played in. You were in the female. I didn't right? see this game. The only one of Ravi's games I saw in full was the one um, yeah. that got him his GM title in the French right. French cool. defence. Cool. But um, this is actually probably good for White now. I, I don't know. I mean, I think eventually Ravi won this game. I'm, I'm not sure. It, it was very messy. I uh, know, oh hang on. And maybe this game in a draw. He was actually losing at this point. It says White won on the thing. I oh know, White won. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at this point, he should have lost. I mean, he was losing. Right? This, this ending was, was losing. Um, yeah, I mean, this is all fine, but Eventually, um, maybe here, like, B4 is a move, actually. Is that a move? No. Wondering. Like. Anyway, eventually, Black ended up losing the game, which is quite incredible. But... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you could just go Bishop B5 here and make a draw if you want. You know, you should never lose from here. So he always... And what did he do, actually? He went... Yeah, oh, no. Ah, yes. Yeah.
No, I think it was a draw. I think it was actually a draw. I might remember. Oh, let me just see what happens. How the game went. Are you sure you didn't lose this position? Oh, no, maybe you did lose. Ah, oh, it was a draw. Yeah, it was a draw. And why is it? So oh, it just says white one for some reason. No, no, I probably just put the result in incorrectly. But anyway, yeah, hopefully that was useful for you, Zoe, and yeah. hopefully that was useful for your viewers, you know? What do you want me to work on before the next session? Anything you want. <laughs> Actually, what you could do is maybe play some training games with a computer and say, look, you know, learn about this opening and show me the games. Or play some training games against people in an opening. Maybe in the Queen's uh, Indian is back. And try and get that D4 break in, you know, just to show that you learned something. But I mean, I feel like your chess is progressing, but yeah, I think it comes down to a confidence thing. The moment, you know, you've said before that you haven't been able to play as much as you would have liked. And, um, you know, that uh, I feel like you, I, I told you before, I saw like clear progress. But you know, there's clear issues there as well. You're losing to like 10 year old kids and stuff, you know, it's like, if you want to get to the next level, you have to kind of cut out those kind of horrible, painful losses, right? Mm. Would, that, would, would that be a fair call? Yeah, I, I think I'm terrified of juniors. It's like, I'll see an 1800 junior and be convinced I'm going to lose, but if I see an 1800 adult, I'm like, okay, I'll win. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I, I feel the same. I, like, I mean, well, not, I mean, I used to have a bit of a fear of juniors, but um eventually you realize they're just people like you and, and eventually they were going to become old farts as well but i think it's more the comfort zone thing is important like you know and i often find that i play probably play better against even in a way weaker opposition sometimes because i don't feel the fear and i can just concentrate on playing good chess well sometimes when i'm playing against good players you can get out psyched by them mm -hmm. so maybe you're getting outside you're allowing yourself to be out psyched so maybe work on your psychology as much as anything, you know? Yeah. Is um, ninety percent of the battle. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for the lesson, Danny. That was really helpful. And to anyone That's watching right. this, I really hope you enjoyed it. So let us know in the comments if you liked it, if you want to see more of this kind of thing. And if any of you are interested in uh talking with Danny about getting some coaching, then get in contact because he does have a couple of slots available now. So um yeah, and you can have stuff like this directly from Danny. So yeah, thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you all with another video uh, soon.